live from the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. It's the Cube, covering DevNet Create 2018. Brought to you by Cisco. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage here in Mountain View, California for Cisco's DevNet Create. It's their cloud native developer ecosystem. Uh, a new initiative, only a year and a half old. Uh, great cloud native DevOps oriented. I'm John Furrier, your host with my co-host, Laura Cooney, who's our next guest is Damon Edwards, Chief Product Officer of Rundeck. Welcome to theCUBE, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again as well. So, you were just on stage giving a yeah, talk. I was. About ops. DevOps. I was bumming people out. That's what that's what I was. Uh, that's what I was doing. So a lot of uh, all the Cisco early stuff was about new products and new toys and new awesome stuff. And then my talk uh, was about how silos and tickets ruin everything, right? That we've got all these great advances on the dev side of the house and delivery side of the house and the new technologies we've got and everything's uh, high flying and going to be perfect until it all hits operations and things tend to go go wrong. So I walked through a bunch of uh, kind of a. Names were changed to uh, hide the not so innocent. We went through some incidents and just sort of the tales of woe and how the disconnect and the uh, basically the siloed way of working, number one, uh, kind of we group like with like in operations, very siloed. But also number two, um, that we run our lives through these uh, ticket driven request queues, right? And uh, request queues or queues in general, if you look on the, the product side and then the, the sort of the physics, the queuing, the queuing theory behind it, queues are economically very expensive things. You know, they add a lot of delays, they add a lot, create a lot of bottlenecks, they, uh, they everyone's, they, you can't, the, your, I ask you to do something, I write it down, you take it off the queue, you know, a week later, the context is all different, right? So we have all kinds of bottlenecks, all kinds of quality problems, all kinds of delays, and it's just an expensive way to work, yet that has become the de facto way that we run our lives. And instead of using tickets for what they're good at, which is uh, handling problems, we use tickets as the general work permission system for the entire, uh, operations organization, and it's you know no no surprise that silos and and, and ticket driven request queues that we get what we get, and so the talk was about how to say well how can we get stop using tickets as the primary way of, of, of doing things, um, how do we re, how do we kind of look at the organization and remove the need for handoffs right uh, between those silos, and then replace where we can't get rid of the handoffs with self service right pull based self service interfaces where people can get what they need to get done, those, do those operational tasks for themselves, mm -hmm. and then move on, right? That's, Great. Uh, that's Great. what it's all about. Great, so tell, tell us a little bit about what your company does and how you're solving this problem, because it's definitely a problem that's out there right now. And yeah. people aren't talking about it a whole lot because it's kind of the ugly underbelly of development and ops. You know, they're trying to solve it, but it's they don't less, really want to talk about it. It's less sexy because you get, you get you, you get a promotion for delivering the next big project, mm -hmm. right? Saying you fix kind of how operations work, it generally doesn't, you know, the board of directors doesn't know your, doesn't mm -hmm. know your, uh, doesn't know your name. So uh, that's kind of problem number one. But how, how Rundeck uh, factors into this is we make tools for SREs and systems administrators to number one, organize all their scripts and tools, connect all the scripts and tools, uh, that the platforms they, current, they currently have across those, those silos, create standard operating procedures, and then probably most importantly, um, use the access control features to start to give access to people who, who are traditionally outside of those operational mm -hmm. boundaries. Let developers participate in operations, let QA participate in operations, let business analysts participate in operations. All those requests they normally have mm -hmm. of operations, create those services, let them, um, you know, let them do them. By doing that, you're creating more capacity in operations to, to focus on issues you really need to, need to be solved, and you're making everybody else happy because you're staying out of their way. Mm -hmm. They can move faster, have fast feedback, higher quality, all that stuff. You know, we've done a lot of crowd chats and we've had the questions come up. Is it the culture or is it the tooling? Yeah. Or is it the people? I've got all the above culture, everyone goes to the low, that's the low thing. Yeah, the culture's got to be there. You guys are doing tooling. Can you talk about some of the things that you've seen that works? How does someone go, hey, first it's self-awareness, we got we to change this. And so if someone's into that mindset, I want to move to the new model, to be more agile, to actually streamline those mm -hmm. silos and that ticket system, what tooling do they need to use? What are you guys providing? Where's the, the, in, the steps? What's the sequence of yeah. well, tooling and adoption and picks and shovels? Number one, use what you have. Right, yeah. so this idea that, oh, okay, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to teach everybody to use this one tool. So everyone's got to learn this DSL or this you know, kind of language. It just never works. I mean, you know, three years ago it was one tool, we all know the name. A couple years ago it was another tool, we all know the name. You know, these configuration management tools. Now we're on to the new container world. They're like, oh, I don't know if we need that or not. Everyone wants to do what they need to do, so let them do what they need to do. It's a very lean idea. 
focus on how to connect those things. Focus on how to kind of orchestrate and organize what you've got um, already. And then from there, focus on you know, how do we do two things. Limit those handoffs, so that, that kind of is more of an organizational issue. And number two, uh, all those handoff points. Anything I need something from you, John, yeah. like, you know, or you, Lauren, I don't want to have to say, do this for me, and you do this for me, and I'm going to wait, and you've got five other things you're working on, you should create services that I can pull from. I mm -hmm. need something from you, I need, you to, I need yeah. something you would normally do. Hit, a, hit an automated service, sort of like, uh, don't do the old sort of savvist managed service you know, way of doing things, do it the Amazon way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is, I can hit an API and get what I want when I want it, and most importantly, it's not just a one-way button I can push, but I can actually um, create those buttons myself, yeah. right? So I can give the thing that I need to do, you can look at it and say, yeah, that's, that's going to work, give me back permission to go, to, go, to go and run it. Everybody's happy, you guys get more, uh, in the scenario, get more uh, capacity, and I get what I want without having so to So is microservices going to impact operations in a way? Because what you're getting at yeah. is more of a microservices, to. more of the primitives are going to be in the ops side. So there's a development mindset mm -hmm. anyway. Is that standard DevOps now is ops? Well, you need to um, handle the operational concerns as early in the life cycle as possible, meaning developers have to build from, it's kind of like in the car world, you build a car for manufacturability. You have to build the services for op op operability. And um, so that's number one. And with the new kind of microservices decoupled world, you have to move to this model of operations because the old monolithic work bounces across, across these silos, it just doesn't work in this decoupled world. It makes everything kind of grind to, back to a, a lump and mass of, of, of who knows what. Yeah. Um, so if you want to let the organization decouple, you have to yeah. be able to decouple your operations to match that. So, so how long is it taking for customers to kind of realize the value of your solutions that you bring to the table, and how much time is it saving them? Yeah, I mean, for, uh, you know, for Rundex specifically, um, you know, because it, it doesn't force you to learn new languages, uh, you can start with what you've got today. So literally, you know, it's days, right? Start plugging in things that you have, uh, you can set up the access control, you can set up you know, kind of the options, the interface, and next thing you know, I've got this self-service interface, and I can turn around and let somebody, let somebody use it. So, you know, Rundeck doesn't do the culture and the organization change for you, mm -hmm. it just becomes a tool that greases that. It makes it a lot easier to get that, to what get that What specifically in the tool that works for customers that, that's uh, resonating in your tool? What's the, what's the big impact when people engage with you guys? When do they know what, when to bring you in for the tool? Sure. Let's just say that the, the gurus come in, hey, okay, here's the culture, you know, you do yeah. some you know, yoga, or whatever you got to do in the culture wise, <laughs> you make that happen. You come sure. in, what do you do? So for us, we're kind of, I guess, a, more the bottom up, right? It's usually a team that says, hey, we're getting overrun with these requests. Yeah. Or it's this team that's saying, we've got to get, you know, like, it can be as simple as our restarts are, are a mess. There's too many ways to do things across all these tools. And then it's, hey, these people keep bugging us to do this. Or that team keeps bugging us to refresh this environment. Or this team, uh, we need to give them access if something goes wrong in production to run some health checks to see what's happening. So really those kind of operational support type of use cases and it's generally at the team level being brought in to solve these different problems. And then where it really the gas gets poured on is when the upper management is following all the DevOps and SRE conversations and realizes things need to change, yeah. then they usually see Rundeck as, ooh, we can use that, right? Yeah. That's going to help us unlock things and let's do more of that and it spreads from team to So team. you're really not trying to come in and boil the ocean over, you come in on a very specific you know, entry point and then get momentum and scales. Yeah. I mean, we get organizations that aren't touching their culture at all. It's literally just, we're doing things the old classic offshore uh, kind of you know, app, application operations call center model and um, we're just going to get better at that and use Rundeck to create more capacity, standardize things, bring some more people into this process and that's it, and they're very successful as that. And then, but the really exciting ones is when the coder gets caught up into the larger organizational mm -hmm. transformation. You mentioned SRE, Site Reliability Engineers. Google yeah. uses that term. So I got to ask you, we were talking before we came on camera about um, no ops, you know, sure. having a, a no, ops, no ops culture because DevOps is more developer. And we were kind of poo-pooing that and you were kind of more aggressive. I won't say what you said to me because uh, it's a, you know, a children's uh, New York show here. Um, yes, I'm sure a lot of children know. are watching the queue. <laughs> <laughs> no, the ops guys. Um, no, pun intended. Um, so, Google is really hardcore on this. Yeah. Do you have an opinion on this? Ops, no ops, DevOps, well, ops, role I mean, of ops. I mean, it's ridiculous. Ops, ops happens, right? I mean, ops. Every day, you know, John Allspot is a, was formerly at Etsy and now he's a kind of a researcher, does this thing at conferences where he says, everybody raise your hand, if, if, if I locked everybody out, said hands off the keyboard, you can't do anything, how many of your companies would still be in business tomorrow? Or in a week? Or in a month? 
horny ear and people's hands kind of going, going yeah, similar, yeah. similar to you know, a day in a week, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And the reality is operations happens, right? You have, these are complex, you know, moving systems, uh, yeah. interacting with complex things in the world and you have to be able to operate them. So, you know, the original no-ops idea was, oh, I don't want to have a separate thing called operations. I want to distribute to operations where it makes, it makes sense and have engineers everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Google has an interesting view, which is, no, we have a distinct organization, but they call it SRE, and they use more software engineering discipline to do, they have a whole kind of methodology yeah. behind it, but they're very much proving you can still have a separate engineering and operations organization and do it right. And then there's folks like Netflix and, and, uh, you know, and Amazon who are more like, no, no, we're going to distribute it within, within these cross-functional teams in the organization. I mean, it's still ops, no matter how you slice that, but, but here's the thing. I mean, my observation, people get confused with automation and operations. Yeah. So just because you're automating something doesn't mean it goes away. Right. <laughs> right? You might have, you know, automate some tasks and things. Or it can make it worse. Yeah, so talk about the, that, 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 that pull, push, that tug uh, between that, because it's a tension that's positive, because yeah. you want to automate things that you're doing multiple repetitive tasks on, yep. but you just move, you have to eliminate some tasks, but yep. you're still operating. Talk about that dynamic. Well, I mean, there's certain things computers are very good at. Repetitive, known tasks computers are great at. When it takes human creativity, or sort of the super kind of complex uh, connecting the, uh, the dots, humans are good at that. So how do you automate as much of the things as possible that the computers are good at, and that gives you the time and the, and the, and the, 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 the cognitive bandwidth to focus on the creative things. Creative in building things, creative in, oh crap, we got to solve this, right? And uh, the tools should be there to support that. Um, the idea that you can, automate all of that away, it just, it's not, it's just so not Give an example of, if you, if you look forward five years and think about how we're moving fast with, with the evolution of cloud and everything else that's sure. happening, Kubernetes, IOT, AI, all this great stuff's happening. Mm -hmm. You got blockchain, you got cryptocurrency, a lot of things going on that are super positive that also could be detrimental. Where does the human piece come in? Where will always be the pieces where human creativity, human intuition, human judgment, where is it always going to shine? What specific things do you see never going away? Uh, I think this is what you said, the intuition and the judgment, right? In, in the day-to-day -day work activities, you need to use that intuition and judgment to get things done, to see the different signals and understand what they mean, to create new solutions on how to kind of solve these new, these, these new challenges. Um, you know, that is where the human beings are needed. So it's both in the delivery time and in the idea of operations. You, you think of like an airplane, Right, you know, there's still pilots. You think of a nuclear power plant. Yeah. There's still there's still there's still operators. Tons of automation, tons of alarms, tons of of things to, to assist them. Yeah. But it still comes down to you know the things that human brains are 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 good at. So there's always a role for. So categorically, human. obviously, security, mm -hmm. latency is one, multi-cloud workload moving. I mean, the areas that you can start to see the categorical areas that are yeah. never going to go away, right? Yeah, and at a certain point, you're going to things where, you'll, where the, the the platforms get better and you kind of climb the stack, mm -hmm. and more things that only a human being could do in the past, you can start to use, you know, mm -hmm. to automate things. Like deployment. Deployment mm -hmm. used to be a human task. Now we start to standardize things, have standard parts, have yeah. virtualization, now the cloud, now, you know, now all the uh, cloud native technologies. That allows you to say, okay, we standardized these things and built the right tooling, now we can focus the humans on more important, more important problems and move at a higher velocity mm. with better quality. Great. Awesome. Well, I mean, great stuff. Okay, what's going on for you? What are you up to now these days? What events are you going to? Uh, what are you working on? What are the cool things you're excited about right now? Cool and excited about. Uh, the DevOps Enterprise Summit, um, you know, I've uh, been involved that in a number of years. That is the best collection of, I think, enterprise, yeah. you know, big corporation thinking um, around all, the whole kind of sphere of tra yeah. transformation. And it's growing too, so just right, yeah. give a quick yeah, plug yeah, on yeah. that. Yeah, 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 it's growing. There's one now, in a, uh, there's one in London, there's one now going to be in Las Vegas. Um, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 people. Um, I thought uh, SREcon, um, SRE is, is a, is, it's the, it's like a specialized um, yeah. implementation of all this DevOps uh, thinking. Um, I think that's another great place to, uh, to, um, to be. And then, uh, you know, DevOps days, Velocity, all the kind of traditional mm -hmm. conferences and these. Uh, great community, got to say, being uh, involved in the DevOps mm -hmm. from day one, watching the, the pioneers and a few with arrows in their back, but now going mainstream, it's super exciting. I think Kubernetes brings, you know, that mainstream yeah. just highlights everything. That's that platform I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. Platform. Yeah. A lot of the concerns that human beings had to struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis are now being put into yeah. the orchestration and scheduling mm -hmm. and, you know, the containerization of, of, of things.
producing. David, pictures. great work. Congratulations on all the work you've done. Been a real uh, contribution to the industry. Oh, thank and you. Good luck with the business. Thanks for coming thank on theCUBE. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, this is CUBE live coverage here. Mountain View for Cisco's DevNet Create. Really the Cisco's foray into cloud native, really getting at that DevOps culture, once we're solving big problems, programming the network. Cisco's bringing that together with their communities. Of course, theCUBE's here covering it. More live coverage after this short break. Oh, <laughs>